Assembly, writing and reading in the back. for uh, this opportunity to speak and tell you about some of the very recent work that I've been doing with my postdoc advisor, uh, Michael Brenner. Um, and so the thing that's really been exciting us and, and getting us interested here is this idea that we can use uh, active self-propelled colloids as a, as, as a functional machine or a tool to complete some sort of task that we want to do. Right? So, so can we actually do this? Can we harness individual motion of these self-propelled particles that we've been hearing so much about this week. So of course, the answer to this question is going to depend on the type of task that you're, you're trying to do. Some, for some things, this is probably going to be completely trivial. For some things, there's going to be absolutely no way at all this is going to work. So, to, so what my, my goal for today really is to, through example and some proof of principle um, simulations, show you that we can actually do some pretty cool things. Okay? So the example that I'm going to be starting with really comes from the world of self-assembly, uh, where one of the goals is to take a bunch of particles or objects of some sort, the micron scale, design them in some way so that they come together and form some structure that you want to build. Okay? And one of those structures that is fairly hard to do um, with some typical self-assembly techniques um, is, to, is to make braids and weaves. So braids and weaves are... are are very common at the macroscopic scale. We're all wearing clothes that are weaves. I don't know if anybody here has braided hair. Um, I sort of like this example here of a wicker basket because it shows how a weave can, or you can use weaving to create a 3D rigid structure. Right. So basically, can we turn um, these uh, one-dimensional filaments, so, so some sort of one-dimensional filament, into these types of structures at the microscopic scale? Okay. And there's one thing that I want to point out here. Um, for example, if you look at this, this braid here, if you hold the top and bottom, right, there's no way that this braid is going to unwind. It can't unbraid if you hold the top and bottom. So, so it's a very stable structure. But that also has a consequence in the fact that if you want to braid this up in the first place, you have to braid at the end. You can't start braiding spontaneously throughout. Um, you, know, you can't start braiding up here and down here at the same time. It won't, it won't work in the middle. Right? Um, so in order to... to make any progress of this, we really, I mean, maybe there's ways of using equilibrium techniques, but those are going to be very difficult. So the approach that we're going to take, and to sort of give you an idea of this approach, I first want to show you a picture. Um, so this here is my sister, um, age six. Uh, does anybody have any idea what she's doing? It's kind of hard to tell in this picture, but does anybody know? It's maple. Yeah, yeah, so she's doing what's called maple dance. All right, so basically the idea here is that you take a big pole, shove it in the ground, then you attach a bunch of ribbons at the top, and the pole, and then all the dancers hold on to the ribbons, and then they dance around each other. Actually, I should say, my sister would want me to say that they, they skip around each other. That's apparently very important. But, so, so they're skipping around each other, but they're not just randomly moving around. There's some choreographed um, pattern. So for example, some of these guys are going to be moving clockwise, some of them are going to be moving counterclockwise. And when they pass, say, say you pass one person coming at you on the left, and the next time you pass somebody, you're going to be moving on the right. You're going to pass them on the right. So you can, if, they, if they weave in and out of each other, and since they're all holding on to these ribbons, you see that at the top, you're going to get a braided structure. Okay? And so the basic idea that we're going to be playing with is can we replicate this at the colloidal level or at the microscopic level by simply replacing these human dancers with active colloids? Okay? Um, I also want to emphasize that one of the things here is that this is this technique really converts two-dimensional motion into a three-dimensional object. Right? So basically, we're going to be playing around with converting motion into a structure. Okay. So there's there's one other thing that we should say. Obviously, the the hard part with what I just described is that you have to precisely control the motion of these active particles, which typically just move around in you know in, in very different ways. Um, but you don't have to control the motion absolutely precisely. You just need to control what I'll call the topology of the motion. Basically, if you're supposed to move around, you know, you're supposed to pass somebody on the left, it doesn't matter whether you pass them 
taking a very long arc or a very sharp arc um, as long as you pass them on the right side. Right? So if you think of different, um, you know, different non-trivial examples of these types of topological motions, the simplest one that I can think of, so basically by non-trivial I mean something not like a simple, simple rotations or something like that. Um, the simplest one I could think of was a figure eight. So basically, can we get take two dancers that are going to be fixed and then have the third dancer do a figure eight around them? Right? Can we do this with colloids using only active forces and then some sort of non-specific short-range attractive forces? So for example, depletion interactions here. Okay. And so to give you an idea of how we might do this, um, let's first start with, with three, three colloids. The first one actually won't be a colloid. We can think of this as a fixed micropillar or something like that, you, um, created with photolithography. And then we're going to have an active colloid here. And the active colloid is always going to push into this, this passive colloid here. Right? So there's going to be some rule um, that we can talk about how you would actually design this if you want. But for now, I just want to take this as a given rule. So the active colloid is always going to feel this force into the passive colloid. Okay? Then we're going to have um, some short range attractive interactions. Again, this is just something like depletion interactions. Right? That's going to keep these attached to the fixed micropellet. So I'm also not showing the, the depletion interaction here, but I think that's clear. All right, so if this is all I had in the system, then I, I hope everybody sees that the active colloid will push in the passive one, and they'll just move around in a circle around the fixed micropellet. Right? So that's not what I want. What I want is a figure eight. And the way we can do that is if we have a second fixed micropellet here, so that the spacing here is, is just big enough for the active and passive colloids to fit in between. All right, then if I let this run, these guys will move over here, and, and when the passive particle fits in between here, the, the depletion forces will cancel out. Right, so I'm going to get a net force from the active particle up into the left, and then there, so if that force is strong enough, they can jump up over here. It'll also, the, the active particle will, will be caught here, but it's, it'll still feel the force up into the left, so that they'll jump completely off the first fixed particle and onto the second fixed particle or fixed micropillar. Right. So I hope everybody sees that they're coming around here, then they'll go around this way, and they'll continue to do a figure eight like this. So we can actually simulate this with a, so this is a very coarse simulation, where I'm just basically trying to get the idea across. Um, here we've got our two uh, fixed micropillars. We've got an active particle and a passive particle. Um, and the, the active and passive particles are fixed to move in two dimensions here, which, again, if you have deplet depletants in your system already, they're going to keep these colloids fixed down at the bottom of the, of the sample. Um, so, so that's not an issue. And then I've got uh, these filaments coming out, so two filaments coming out of the fixed micropillars, and one filament coming out of the active colloid. And then if I let this run, here you see them start to do the first sort of handoff motion, and then they're going to come around and do the second, and you can see them doing this figure eight. All right? As this keep, keeps on going, you, you can see this braided structure starting to come up in these filaments. Right, now, of course, if, if I just run this indefinitely, since I haven't bound anything up here, it'll start to untwist or unbraid at the top. But that's certainly easy to do. We can just you know, find, find some way of, of clamping these things up there. Right, but this is really just the beginning. Right? We can keep going here. Um, for example, we can treat this as a building block. So there's a number of other things we can do. Um, here, I've just taken the, the two fixed micropillars and extended that to five so that instead of just doing a figure eight, the active and passive colloids are weaving in and out. Right? I've also, uh, I can tell you about the details of this, but I basically allowed this filament to grow as it moves. And if you match that growth approximately to the speed of the active and passive particles, then you don't need to worry about the friction between uh, the filaments. All right, so here you're getting basically a, a standard weave structure. Right? Here, what I've got is basically two spinners. Uh, so I've moved the fixed colloids away from each other. The details of that don't really matter. They could just be normal rotators. Um, but I've attached two filaments uh, to each of them. All right? So they're starting to get twisted together. Right? And they're twisting in the same direction. And then I've, I've attached them together at the top so that, that these twists can't untwist. And what happens is that since you can't untwist them, then to release some of the tension that builds up, you get the secondary super twist in the opposite direction. Right, so this is called a twist braid, and it's actually how rope is made. Right, so basically this is you know, possibly a way of creating micron scale rope. Right. Um, so one other thing I, I want to mention, there are a number of ways of directing this colloidal motion that I'm talking about. 
Um, I've just shown you sort of one example. And if you don't really like the, uh, the rule that I put in about the active particle moving into the passive particle, here's a way where you can kind of avoid that. So the, the, the fixed uh, micropillars created with photolithography can be in any shape you want. That's one of the advantages of photolithography. And so if you just load them up a little bit and then make them come to a point when they're near each other, then you can replace the active and passive colloids with some sort of rod. Right? So here, if you just consider a, 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 an active rod-shaped colloid, where, so it's always going to be pushing in this direction, then it's, you know, when it's over here, it's just going to be sliding along. Again, it's going to be bound to the uh, micropillar with depletion interactions. But then when it, when it gets here, you see it's going to move from position 1 to position 2 and then to position 3, so it'll effectively transfer from the right micropillar over to the left one. All right. Then it's going to come around here and then again move over. So you, I hope everybody sees this, this is another way of getting a figure in motion. We're essentially just building a track. Right? This is nothing too complicated. But now we can start to extend this again, just like we did before. So here's a way of, of you know, you can use these eye-shaped micropillars to get these to do sort of this weave pattern, you know, and then come around. And then we can also start to do much more complicated things. All right? So here, if you take a line of these, and these continue off here, um, if you take a line of these tracks that's horizontal and a line that's vertical, you can have them go through each other. Right? So there's a lot, a lot of things you can do to create really complicated um, structures that, you, that we don't even really think about with a macroscopic scale. Um, so this, this is an effective building block. Um, so let me just wrap up here. I think I'm basically out of time. I just want to emphasize the main point that I'm trying to make, which is that I think there's a huge amount of potential for using active self-propelled colloids as functional tools. And I really think we're just scratching the tip of the iceberg here with what we can do. Now, I, I showed you some um, examples of braiding and weaving, which I think is, is interesting in its own right, um, and how we can start to build up uh, these, these building blocks for doing fairly complicated assembly. So with that, let me thank you, um, thank all these people for awesome discussions, um, and take any questions you have. Thank you. Uh, are there questions? Yeah, uh, definitely. Lift your arm if you want to ask a question, then we can get the microphone from your place. Is there is there a systematic way to relate the pattern that you have at the bottom? Like the track the, yes. to the to the braids? Yeah, um it I mean it, in so are you talking about the the type of structure that you get from the braid? Yeah, I mean what you showed you know, I can see how you can try different things, but do you have a way you probably do actually, but I, I just it wasn't clear to me, but is there a, a clear or easy way to do this systematically so that you can relate types of uh, like topology on the like on the, your bot of des designing the tracks yeah, so, so, to the three. So first structure. of all, I don't know if there's a way to do it for any structure. Um, so what I'll say is that so you can classify braids. There's a braid theory, the braid group that you that you can classify any braid uniquely, and then it basically boils down to taking the structure and reducing it to individual swaps. So you take the third filament and the second filament and swap them either this way or that way. So then you need to design a structure, um, and I don't know if there is a completely robust you know, a, a systematic way of doing that for everything, um, but but then you I mean then you just need to design your track so that that will happen and then the next one will happen. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, do you have any plans to collaborate with like DNA origami people to actually make this? Yeah. Sort of yeah. So. Um, I, th I think there's, so, so I've talked with a couple experimental groups about possibly doing this. Um, I think there's a couple things that need to be done sort of in, I don't think, you know, tomorrow all this will be done immediately. Um, you know, I, I think the first step is, you know, just getting things to move along these tracks, but then, and then attaching them, and so I, I think there's like a couple of steps along the way. Um, I think another issue that we've thought a lot about and are still working on exactly is the amount of forces that can be applied. So this is one of the things that um, is, I think, really important for this audience is sort of the amount of forces that these active particles can apply on, you know, how much load can we carry. And so there's, I think, also a bit of a, a design aspect of that, of trying to 
you know, depending on what material you want to braid, can you increase the amount of force sufficiently? To create a knot, you have to go. Yes, that, that's the, that's the next thing. Um, okay. So, so I'd love to be able to create knots. I think my, my hope is that, I mean, ideally, what I'd like is to have a collie that can just, you know, drive around in three-dimensional space and do whatever I want. That's that's sort of um, a more complicated thing. I don't see any further questions. Uh, one more. Uh, The simulation was there anything thermal? The yeah, there was a brownie in the name. That was the top, but the particle, nothing was brilliant in the surface. They, they, they were. So, so the, I, mean, the, I mean, you can change the temperature. I was just trying to give you sort of a, a proof of principle so simulation. They would stick to the pose and never escape or anything. So, so it, it was a thermal simulation. They did fall off. Um, if I kept, if I left the first movie that I had running, um, it actually, sometimes they miss, so, so they're supposed to do the figure eight. Every once in a while, they go around the circle twice, you know, one, one, one of the particles twice. Um, I didn't want to go into that during that, but absolutely that can happen. It can't happen with the tracks that I showed you a little bit later on. That's more robust. Okay, let's end the speaker again.